Technology takes up an enormous part of our lives. It distracts us from living our real life. It takes away our eyes and our ears. I'm glad none of you are on your phone tonight. No, you're all watching. You're probably watching screens, though. Do you know that, on average, we spend eight hours a day looking at screens? That's an enormous amount of our lives today. Only a few years ago, it was six hours. But to be eight hours, and soon it's going to be more. As uni students, you're probably looking at screens a lot more than that. And what I want to think about is, how is that going to help us break new ground? I find that the products I develop and the experiments I do all come from living in the real world, using my eyes and using my ears. I'm going to tell you about some of those experiments and some of the products I've developed by using my eyes and my ears and trying to get those back. Because I think if I can get those back, I'll be able to develop better products and live a better life. Let me tell you about this jacket. So what you might not know is this is actually wearable technology. This is an experiment. It's not in production. It's something I'm doing just to work out how to use technology better to enhance my life. It was a real product, and it was to solve a real problem. So what happened, I was traveling in New York, and I was going to over 10 meetings a day, and I wasn't actually experiencing New York. This was what I was seeing. Or as you can see in the photo, I was seeing pavements. But worse than that, I was tripping over, I was falling down potholes, nearly being hit by cars. People walk on the other side of the pavement over there. <laughs> Something else about New Yorkers is they don't get out of the way. I've never been shoulder barged by so many people in my life, and that doesn't help when you're looking at a phone. So I asked someone, actually engaged with someone on the street, they were a bit taken back that I'm actually talking to them, and said, where can I go to a park and see the sunset in New York? I wanted to get away from all the people and the sort of technology and the buildings and the lights. And they were like, why would you want to do that? You'd just be looking at New Jersey. I'm like, OK, <laughs> you don't get it, don't get it, that's fine. I don't want to go look at New Jersey, I just want to see the water and I want to see the sunset. So I took my own advice and I walked down to the river. And sitting down in the river, I thought, I've been here five days and I haven't seen anything. All I've seen is my phone, checking emails and calendars and things like that. But spent most of my time trying to work out where I had to be next instead of where I wanted to be now and looking around. And we saw a speaker talk earlier today and I'd say, I'm not a futurist, I'm a nowist. All of the things I do is because I live in the now and I look around me. So I came up with this jacket in New York and I got my eyes back. How it works is I put the destination in my phone, Google Maps helps me do turn-by-turn -turn navigation, and then it uploads all of those turns to my jacket, and I put my phone in my pocket. From that point onwards, I don't have to look at my phone. It tells me how far I have to go to get to the destination. It tells me when I need to turn. It tells me if I've missed the destination. And all this is through touch. So really simple haptic feedback motors are in my shoulder pads and on my back, and this is in the jacket now, and I can actually use that to get to events like TEDx, I can look at the sun, what a beautiful day it was today, and I can use all of the technology on me to experience the real world. This is version three of the jacket, and the thing about wearable technology is it's going so fast. We don't have time to do documentation. We don't have time sometimes to even do the research on the internet. It's just about doing. It's buying hardware and putting it together really rapidly and learning really fast. I mean, we learn by playing. So the first jacket actually had LED lights down the arm, and it gave you a countdown of how many metres to the corner. We thought this is a great idea. You know, who doesn't want LED lights? Um, really embarrassing. <laughs> that jacket hasn't been pulled out for over a year. The thing is, it was developed in three weeks. Um, we used it for a number of months. We went head-to-head -head with Google after a, a conference last year, um, tried to find a bar together. They used Google Glass and we used the Navigate jacket. Um, we smashed them. We were drunk at the time as well, but at least the jacket helped us get there. And the other thing is, we didn't look like idiots. There's a quote, someone said, Google Glass is like Segway for your face. <laughs> so, that's not my quote, I'm not going to claim that one, but I tell you what, that is what working wearable technology is like. When I look around me at all the products out there and all the young budding designers out there and engineers, when you're thinking about products, don't just do tech for tech's sake. I mean, as an engineer, I'm an electrical engineer, Google Glass is amazing, like as a technology piece. As a piece of fashion, it's god-awful. That's cool. There's a lot of technology out there in, you know, in the wearable tech space, and there's things that I've always stayed away from. Things like quantifying your health. Do I really need to know that I don't get enough exercise? It's called a mirror, or looking down. It's got a bit of a gut. <laughs> and it's just like we don't need these distractions in our life. It's about getting your eyes back and getting out there. If you actually got out there and experienced the world, stopped looking at screens or checking your health profile, maybe you wouldn't need a Fitbit or a fitness tracker. 
So that's not where I started in wearable tech. It's been a bit of a career change for me. I wasn't always, I was always an engineer doing software development. This is what brought me to wearable tech, Funderware. So Funderware was a crazy project that started uh, 2013, um, very early on, January 2013. We had three months to design some lingerie that connected couples over the internet so people in long distance relationships could touch each other. And I'm not wearing them now, so don't worry. But if I was, I wouldn't give anyone here the controller, that's for sure. The amazing thing about the, the Funderware that we created, first of all, I wanted to ask, put your hand up if you've heard of it. Okay. About a third, and then keep your hand up if you'd buy a set. Okay. Not too many, but I know from the inquiries I get, there's a lot of people that want these. The funny thing is, it was an experiment. It was done with Durex, and it was done to have a bit of fun. And I think getting back to what it means to be a human, we've talked about getting your eyes back, living in the real world, there's something else that we're all forgetting, and that's just to have fun. We had fun doing this project, and what the project was about was bringing couples together and them having fun. It doesn't all have to be about quantifying and serious stuff. So keeping a sense of humour, doing those things that keep you engaged in what you're doing, you can create great stuff. The Funderware is also successful because you don't look like a computer. Working on this stuff, I don't know anything about garment design. I'm not a fashion designer, I'm a techie. So I had to team up with Billy Whitehouse, who is an amazing designer, and taught me all of these things about garment design, which I never knew. One of the things I had to work out is, where the hell do you put these batteries? So there's just a crazy amount of tech that needs to go into these things. But it uses something so simple as touch to communicate that someone's thinking about you. Now, I'm hoping that there's some other engineers and designers in the room, because we've got challenges that need to be met in this world, and people do want to know that people, other people are thinking about them. A lot of the inquiries for Funderware come from people in the armed forces. So, people in long-distance relationships, there's a lot of people that just want to know that their partner's thinking about them. There's a number of things we worked out working on this project that I want to share with you tonight. A couple of them really important to the future of technology, and especially wearable tech. One of them, security. Who would have thought we'd have Funderware hackers in the future? <laughs> so so you've got to make sure this stuff's really secure. I mean, we've got each pair coded. There is no way you want to wonder, is that my wife touching me? No, OK, don't go there. The other thing is data security. Now, we, we hear all these, like, all the conferences I go to, people talk about data security, and they take it pretty seriously. I would too. It's one of those things where no, no data is truly secure. So if it doesn't add any value to the person whose data it is, like if you generate that data, it's yours, you should always own it. If it doesn't add a lot of value, then companies should just chuck it out. It needs to be thrown away because the sort of data that these systems can collect is terrifying. And so it's not worth keeping this stuff. And I think everyone out there needs to think about wearable tech with the new Apple iOS 8, the health data that we'll be collecting. Where does that data sit? Who owns that data? And if you want to delete that profile, is it really deleted? So either create false profiles or just don't use it. But the companies will get better and they'll just throw this stuff out. It has to be thrown away. There's another side of wearable tech that I really wanted to ask some designers and engineers at the universities and out there if they can help solve these problems for us. One of them is that it's really hard to transfer touch communication to the human skin. You think of all of these companies developing touch screens. I've been working in touch screen industry for over 15 years, and it's phenomenal, the type of technology, to detect touch. But what about transferring it back to the body? Surely the body is the most important thing. And if we're going to develop Internet of Things devices, why aren't we doing it for people? So all of the people out there that have got the capability to design and engineer new technology, we really need some help. I mean, if you think about transferring touch in this jacket is a little motor spinning with a weight on it, that's about as high tech as it gets these days for mass market you know, consumer goods. It's unbelievable that the skin can detect four different types of touch, soft pressure, heavy pressure, vibration and stretch, yet we can only appeal to one of those sensations. During the development of all of our technology, we've looked at other ways to communicate touch. One of them is using electroactive polymers. I'm getting a bit techy here, but 
They're basically plastics. There's a lot of research going on in Australia and New Zealand where you apply a voltage to this plastic and it bends. And you could use it for maybe for replacing muscles or amputee victims. There's amazing stuff that it could provide in the future. There's one serious problem. It uses 4,000 volts to make it move. And there's no way I'm putting 4,000 volts in my clothes. <laughs> so I want to show you this picture. There's these jackets. These ones are actually give you a hug. And there's some of the things happening sort of right in the leading edge of wearable tech. They use air bladders and air pumps. That's about as good as it gets apart from vibration motors. So anyone thinking about getting in this space, it's completely open field for research. Getting back to the experiments, there's a funny thing going on right now. The AFL, I think there's uh, the Hawks are in the lead. There's probably only about 15 minutes to go. Right now, there's 4,000 people wearing alert shirts feeling what's happening during the AFL game. And this is something not many heard about, not many people heard about. We develop wearable tech for Fox Sports, which connects you to the players. So you can feel what the players are feeling. And this, this project was an experiment, and it went out there, and it went to people who subscribed to Fox Sports and wanted to watch the AFL this year. So there's, I hope the server's still running. I don't know if anyone's checked. But our technology should be still feeding live data from every single player on the field so if the elation, whichever team's ahead, every time they get a goal, they feel that elation and there's touch sensations rising up in the chest when they feel that adrenaline. Or the frustrating feeling, a sinking feeling, or the adrenaline of their heart pumping. So all of this exists now, it just needs to be experimented with and we need to get out there and try more of it. The thing is, we're only going to do it if we get back into the real world. I spend a lot of time fishing. If I'm not working on wearable tech or running my other company in the middle of the night, that's what I do. I get out there and I just experience the world. I think we've had a great day today. The amazing food we had. We've had some great performers, singers. No one's using their phone and everyone's been engaged and connecting to other humans. I hope you've met some great people here today. And I think the future of wearable tech is very rich. And hopefully we can walk in our friends' footsteps. We can connect to our partners and feel their heartbeat, see over the horizon and see and feel what other people feel and sense a new sense of empathy for others. Wearable tech will bring people together in new secret destinations, allow us to experience things we've never experienced before, all with the clothes we're wearing. So with that, I leave you and get out there and experience the real world. Thank you very much.